All right. It is my, um, to, to quote one of both of our mentors, it is both my pleasure and my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Shushari um, from uh, Memorial Silk Kettering. Um, he's an associate attending physician um, and uh, really a pioneer and a leader in the field of um, non-skin exposed, uh, non-sun uh, related melanomas. Um, and has done really incredible work in, in the areas of mucosal and uveal melanoma. And um, he'll describe some of those journeys today, and including some of the approved drugs that we have as a direct result of his work. So uh, without further ado, Al. Uh, thanks for hanging with us. Uh, and thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, really beautiful here. I kind of forgot what it's like to have sunshine in my life. Uh, living in Manhattan, uh, if there is sunshine, allegedly, it's usually blocked by a series of skyscrapers. So um, I can see why everyone's uh, happy here. Uh, I don't have to pay rent here, though, or property tax, so maybe that's the, the hidden side. Um, so I, uh, I'm always a fan of telling you what I'm about to tell you, and then telling you, and then telling you what I told you is sort of the uh, the way I've been taught to, to, to give talks. So I want to first sort of define um, this uh, subgroup of, of melanomas and, and why I think they're important for us as physicians. And for those of you in the audience uh, or, or later online, um, you know, who need more resources and help, maybe you have this type of melanoma or your loved one does. Uh, I think it is important to know what, what we are working on. And I will talk mostly about mucosal, although the acromelanomas on the palms and soles, which we've heard about from our dermatology colleagues, are actually, uh, those two tend to be a little bit more similar, uh, and I'll try to explain why I think that. In those types of melanomas, we're trying to improve on the backbone of PD-1-based therapy. Uh, in melanomas that start in the back of the eye, I think many of us uh, physicians believe that PD-1-based therapy is okay, but it's it's uh, it's so lackluster for the average person that we are looking completely elsewhere to try to improve on treatment. So um, with that, I will uh, mention that, um, you know, there are some companies that have uh, supported my work or, or paid me for my opinions, which is always a, a lovely place to be. Um, I think most uh, importantly, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb that makes uh, nivolumab, ipilimumab, Aminocor that makes the uvil melanoma drug I'm about to talk about, and then um, you know things like iAvance that uh, Dr. Betoff Warner talked about has supported our work for for tilt therapy. Uh, I think I'm you'll find that I'm pretty uh, open about the pros and cons of these treatments, so I don't think this influences the opinions you're about to hear spew forward from my mouth. Uh, I'm a big fan of thank yous up front because I, uh, I don't want to run too long and then speed past those. Uh, so my institution's been, been great to me. Um, here at Stanford, really, Dr. Beethoff Warner for, for asking me months ago to come. And right away, my answer was, of course. Um, and uh, for uh, Sam Gilden and Aim at Melano has always been uh, a wonderful force for good. There are a lot of other uh, folks involved with this uh, here. I want to thank. Uh, the patients who uh, and their loved ones who have sort of helped uh, volunteer their their time, their bodies, their they put their trust in us, and uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So you've heard that we've made progress. Uh, it's mostly been in cutaneous melanomas. I think uh, one thing that we're excited about, and it's true, you can't see the pointer, right? Okay. So uh, what we're most excited about is that plateau that, uh, that folks have been talking about this morning, that once you make it to about three to four years with metastatic cutaneous melanoma, um, there's a pretty good chance that you'll do well, and different combinations of immunotherapies have made some progress. So here's uh, another one we, we haven't talked much about. It doesn't really matter for the purpose of this talk, but it's, you know, adding a different sort of uh, cutting a different break in that car compared to ipilimumab is called relatlimab, and that seems to have improved things as well. So we're making progress. 
Um, in the United States, there's a reason we focus on skin melanoma because if you are to get melanoma, you are more than likely to get stuff that started in the skin or the unknown primary, which molecularly uh, looks very much like a melanoma that was in the skin. You never knew you had it. It went away and then creepily years later can just come back and say, wow, I have a lymph node with, with melanoma. I've never had melanoma. But it turns out those are probably the same thing, just caught at different times. And so in the US or in Western Europe or Australia, which is, as I like to call it, Western Europe with, uh, <laughs> with a convict record uh, ancestrally, uh, those are all sort of dominated by sun exposed skin melanomas. And we talk about these so called rare melanomas um, in, in, in this group. And uh, they arise in things like the back of the eye, the inside linings, uh, you know, hairless surfaces of the body that I list there. And then the palms and soles are under the nails that our dermatology colleagues talked about earlier. Um, I don't like using the term rare melanomas because I realize that it's, it's actually a fairly um, sort of Eurocentric view of the world. And, and it's one of those things that I'm trying to consciously correct in myself. Um, in China, where some of the best data for this comes out, uh, um, melanoma is less common in general, but if you are to get melanoma, you're much less likely to get melanoma arising on, on the hair-bearing surfaces, sun-exposed surfaces of the skin. Although it still happens, you have a much uh, larger chance of being diagnosed with what we would consider rare for them just being okay, it's melanoma, it can arise in any of these places. So uh, I think that's a really important um, mindset to have as a, as a clinician. And um, for you guys here in, in California, you certainly have probably on average way more e East Asian ancestry folks than we do. Although New York City, we have a little bit of everything. So um, we carry that forward when we look at the needs that we have in our clinical uh, population. And so here I'll just show you pictorially that these things are molecularly different. So Dr. Pinchain has done a, a great job talking about what you inherited. This is not what you inherit. This is just what we find when we look at the tumors. It probably, uh, as she mentioned, six out of seven times, all of this stuff comes after you're born from just uh, you know, living life, wear and tear on the body. So what I'm showing here is a, is a number of different things, but um, just pay attention to the general pattern. Each person with a skin melanoma is on the vertical axis and their tumors, uh, if they're just simple misspelling, uh, are green. If they are truncated DNA sequences, they're black. And then if things like copy paste errors are present, they are red or blue, and you'll say, what blue? There isn't very much blue here, and I'll show you that in a second. So in skin melanoma, there's a lot of you know DNA mistakes that are spelling errors in green. Um, on the top line there, there's a lot of sort of skyscraper looking things. Uh, that's the mutational burden, how many DNA mistakes there are in that tumor. And you'll see that in the group that has a lot of the black bars on a gene called NF1 in the third line, those tend to have really high mutational burdens. The skyscraper buildings are tall in that top line. And so there's this broad sort of mix of things. And that's what most people think of when they think of melanoma genetics. But you can get things like in the choroid, which is the back of the eye, you can have a melanoma that arises there. And we know that it's very unlikely that sun shined into the back of your eye for that long to get you a bunch of DNA mistakes. And sure enough, when you look at a smaller group um, of tumors here, you don't have to be a, you know, a genetic expert like Dr. Funchain to know that this is a different type of cancer. Um, so these have a different driver, those genes at the bottom that were not there in the skin or hardly ever in the skin um, are present in uveal melanoma. And they don't have a lot of mutations except for one person in this uh, that has that high rise building of a, of a mutational burden. That's probably an inherited uh, uh, case, which is unusual, but not unheard of. 
as Dr. Funchan had mentioned. So, so totally different. In the inside linings uh, of the body, same sort of thing, although you get a little bit more of a spread. If you look at the mutational burden, you see, you know, some higher but mostly lower uh, levels of DNA mistakes. You see some green and, and, and spelling errors, some uh, black bars that are truncations, but you see a lot of these reds and blues. And those are the copy paste error, large deletions or large sort of um, multiply amplified genes. And acral melanomas kind of, trust me on this, look a little bit more similar to the mucosals, um, where some of them have a higher mutational burden, but many of them don't. So these are genetically distinct. If really all else you got from that is, you know, the colors look different, then perfect. You're with me. Um, we've made progress. We just haven't made as much progress as, as we've made. And as I was sitting here listening to all these talks, I had the, uh, I'm a relatively pessimistic person uh, in my own life. I was like, we're getting more and more depressing as the day goes on. So we started off with, how do we prevent this from ever happening? Uh, to now me being like, we didn't do so good. We work hard to do better. Uh, so I'm sorry that we're ending on uh, the place where we probably need the most work. But I hope to convince you that we really are working hard and right at the cusp, I think, of making some big, uh, some big improvements. So how do you treat somebody who needs your help, but their melanoma doesn't have maybe all the DNA mistakes? Their melanoma doesn't have that track record of being really well studied in these large, large, uh, large uh, uh, data set. And this is somebody's, you know, uh, liver in this case that has a lot of these grayish uh, dark uh, tumor spots that's actively threatening someone's life in, in the weeks and months to come. And so we know that the immunotherapies that have led to cures can still cure people with mucosal melanoma, but just not quite as often. And so in this, uh, in, in this plot, I'm asking you just to eyeball the red line on the left in mucosals versus the red line in skin melanomas the green line versus the green line, et cetera. And you can see for mu mu uh, people with mucosal melanomas, it's just a little bit worse compared to the average person with melanoma. Doesn't mean it can't work, it just doesn't work as often. And then we did this analysis that uh, it was led uh, mostly by our colleagues in Australia and Europe. And this sort of said, all right, how often did you use one of the immunotherapy drugs? How often did you use the addition of ipilimumab? Um, where if I go back one to remind you, in skin melanomas, the red is a little bit better than the green. And we've always kind of thought that based on an early analysis of uh, the two drugs in mucosal, we always thought initially it's better to use more. More is, more is better. This is an aggressive disease. But unfortunately, it doesn't really seem like in the real world, when we looked at about 500 cases, that even our best treatment is doing all that great to be honest and um you know i think we need to do better so our colleagues uh in china where as i mentioned have a more broad spread of the types of melanomas that arise uh in 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 folks in their backyard they have uh, the ability to run it's actually i'm jealous of these folks they have a, a very uh, I think centralized process to sort of just, hey, I have an idea. Let's go ahead and run that trial and we'll run it in, in, in Beijing. And they get a bunch of people uh, to participate in that trial and they do them relatively quickly, at least much more quickly than the story I'm about to tell you later in this talk. Um, so in the last 10 or 15 years, most of the important work from mucosal melanoma has actually come from East Asia. And uh, and Dr. Jun Guo, who I'm pretty sure I, I unfortunately butchered the pronunciation of his name every time I, I say it. Uh, but Dr. Guo has been just, you know, I think the, the leading researcher for mucosal melanoma in general, because he puts forth interesting sort of ideas. And in this uh, study, it was using our that backbone of PD-1 blockade that you've heard about and adding a, a pill that blocks new blood vessel formation. And, and this pill is not invented for melanoma. It's, it's been FDA approved for things like kidney cancer, 
Um, this combination recently was approved for kidney cancer, endometrial cancer. There are some other cancers where it's showing activity. They said, listen, let's try it in our patients with mucosal melanoma. And as Dr. Betoff Warner mentioned, you want to see the bars under the horizon here, a so-called waterfall plot with a nice big splash is, is a good news kind of study. So this type of shrinkage rate was pretty darn good for this type of melanoma. But one of the limitations for, for us in the United States is that each and every single one of these patients is, in this case, is of uh, Chinese ancestry and, and treated in China. This was a single center trial. When we looked at this same process of using a PD-1 blocker, in this case, pembrolizumab, plus a different blood vessel blocking pill called linvatinib in this case, they did see in cutaneous melanomas, mostly in Europe, mostly in the United States, they did see some benefit here. And there was initially, you know, some, uh, some interest and maybe this one size fits all approach. Maybe this is something that we can use in general. Unfortunately, oh, I think I took that slide out actually. Unfortunately, it was uh, a negative trial when they actually tried it in a randomized fashion, which is the, the highest bar to sort of prove something. So for skin melanomas, for things in the United States, there isn't like an FDA approved PD-1 and blood vessel blocking combination. But again, back to China, they said, you know what? Why don't we try that same approach um, at a chemo pill? Why? I don't know. They just decided and they tried it in acromelanomas. And guess what? That waterfall looks very powerful. There's a lot of splashes under the water there where about 60% of people in this uh, initial treatment trial for acromelanoma have sh a significant shrinkage of their disease. It's pretty darn good. So again, we're getting our signals from our colleagues in East Asia that maybe not for all comers, maybe not for all skin melanomas, but for these less common, quote unquote, uh, or non-sun exposed, which is the way I like to, to think of them, these non-sun exposed melanomas may be uniquely sensitive to this combination. And so the questions that uh, I had in my mind, uh, this was the early early part of COVID, we were all sitting at home freaking out, you know, and saying like, what can we work on to sort of, you know, uh, feel useful in my job and in my life? Uh, so we started applying for grants and Dr. Betoff Warner did and I did and, and uh, all of us were doing this, right? And I was lucky enough to sort of say, why don't we try the same East Asian approach and just try it in, in, in a U.S.-based population and, and uh, was able to get funding from uh, the NCCN and, and the company Pfizer to study, this is a busy slide, but uh, study what I called the two shots on goal study for, for our patients with mucosal. And just like the Chinese study, we wanted to use a PD-1 blocking drug because that's the backbone that helps some people anyway. And then uh, the blood vessel blocking pill axitinib. And it's a small study. It's only 20 patients. And we basically said the first part of the study, we're trying to just recreate the effectiveness that they saw in the Chinese study, make sure it's not a fluke. And then the second part of the trial is um, if it doesn't work, could we add radiation or, um, or the drug ipilimumab as a triplet? So I, I thought it was uh, a nice idea. Obviously, I was trying to get funding for it. But in reality, it has been a nice, I think, um, option for people to say, you get two chances for a novel treatment for your mucosal melanoma. And so I'm not technically allowed to really give you full, full data updates on this study. We're, they're still sort of maturing. But I wanted to, sh to, to show you we've successfully enrolled all 20 patients just recently. So we're waiting on, you know, some data to mature, but we're seeing sort of three broad patterns. And here are some, these are the real scans um, that we sign off on for official measurements. And here you, you're not gonna be able to see very much. There's a, a red line. This is actually an MRI of the person's rectal tumor. So the sort of, you know, looks like a, I guess, eyebrows and eyes on the, the left side, but that's the sort of 
front of the rectum, the back of the rectum, and they're outlining a, a tumor that was actually quite um, quite painful for this patient. It's about an inch and a half by an inch right in the rectal canal. And uh, quite quickly, we saw shrinkage that's continued. This um, shows us a year of benefit. The person's now close to two years of benefit. And I look at this pattern and say, we can't technically say it was from the pill. You can't technically say it's from immunotherapy. It's, it, it's, it's definitely from one or the other, but probably both. The second pattern is something that we in medical oncology are more used to from a pill or targeted or chemo-based approach, which is it can work for a little while, but then it stops working. And we did have, you know, a couple of folks, unfortunately, get, in this case, a sinus tumor pushing on someone's eye um, that shrunk really nicely, shrunk, stayed shrunk for a short amount of time, but then grew again. And I sort of think of that pattern as maybe the pill was working, maybe not so much the immune system, because as we've shown with, you know, Dr. Betoff Warner showed with, with pill, usually, not always, but usually if the immune system is on the hunt successfully, it can hunt these things down and keep them under control for a while. Um, it's much more common for like a man-made molecule that you just say, swallow that pill, swallow that pill, that the, the tumors will outsmart that one man-made molecule. So I look at this pattern and say, well, maybe this is a pill base benefit, but we got to do a little bit better. And then, of course, there are folks that have not benefited from either approach because we see rapid uh, growth on the first scan. So we are trying to use this uh, as a stepping stone to say, can we prove that you can't just say, I have melanoma, so go get some immunotherapy. It's all the same. Go get it, you know, the same treatment that, um, you know, that uh, someone with skin melanoma has, you should get melanoma's melanoma. I think we're really trying to get more precise with our definitions and do better. Um, I would love to put these head to head. And this is actually the middle part of the talk is actually talking about as a clinical researcher, let me share with the patient community a little bit about what makes our job really exciting and awesome and amazing, but also a bit challenging and frustrating. And if we want to talk about it in another uh, setting, uh, I can use some more colorful language uh, at various points. You can just imagine it in your brain as we go through. So one of the major considerations, we have potentially a couple different trials now showing benefit and say, well, why don't we prove that it's better than the existing process? And the question is, well, who's going to pay for it? And for mucosal melanoma in the U.S. or Europe, it still has this idea that it's, it's too rare to really be worth a company's time and effort uh, and money. Logistically, if a company's not interested, there are cooperative groups. So Stanford, uh, you know, with SWOG, for example, there's, there's academic, um, you know, alliances that are federally funded that help us do these kinds of, of things. Um, we may have to use a slightly different pill. That's a, a bit different, but could we, you know, convince that person? And then, you know, will patients with advocacy groups, will their doctors be okay with saying, I'm going to refer someone elsewhere for a clinical trial? You know, that's something that we have to discuss through. So it's not so straightforward. Um, I'm stuck on number one right now. Um, trying to find somebody who'd be willing to fund this kind of thing. Um, but here's, I should have put a trigger warning on that. I'm sorry that there, you know, how do we, the next big question for us is how do you treat someone who has a tumor just in one spot where uh, Dr. Kalini just said, hey, we can go in and do adjuvant surgery, for example. I, I love that idea. We, we love Dr. Coit's uh, comment about adjuvant surgery. Um, can we use something that uh, can reduce the chances of this so-called localized tumor that is still very, very threatening to somebody's well-being? How do we improve on that? Um, and I'll jump past this uh, just in the interest of time. There isn't a lot of data for using the backbone of immunotherapy, PD-1 blockade, as prevention in mucosal melanoma. So we tried to go after this big unanswered question 
you know, how many people are actually cured in the modern era without medication? Turns out that number is a little bit harder to find than you think. Can you actually predict how many people with modern immunotherapy are still not going to do well? Turns out that is actually difficult to answer uh, in the clinic because we don't have a lot of great uh, modern prospective data. And then how do you actually, you know, best prevent this cancer from coming back? Is it PD-1-based treatment like it is for skin melanoma? Is it chemotherapy, which has shown some benefit in mucosal melanoma? Is it the PD-1 and blood vessel blocking drug that I just showed you has some benefit when you can see the tumor at the start? So this was a big unanswered question. And so um, this is the, the middle part of the talk that I call, no offense, doc, but what takes so long when people want to know, hey, what's the best thing to do? And I sit there and I go, well, this, this and that. And then in the end, you see people's, you know, they're either freaked out or they're uh, sometimes bored and, and sort of saying, cut to the chase. Can't you just give me an answer? Tell me what to do. You're the doctor. Right. And sometimes when you know a bit too much about something, you know what you don't know. And it turns out that it takes a long time to try to get these things together and try to even answer the question. So this is almost nothing to do with the science. I'm going to walk you through a trial that's currently open. You guys have opened it here at Stanford. Thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> um, and it is a seven year long story to get it open. Okay, it doesn't mean we're going to talk about it for seven years, but it's a very long story. So how do you develop a national trial for a so-called rare disease? June of 2015, a cooperative group called the NRG said, hey, we want to get into, you know, melanoma and we want to do uh, their gynecologic group originally. So they want to do vaginal melanomas. And, and we said, okay, here's an idea. We'll give some immunotherapy first, then we'll do surgery, and then we'll actually compare chemotherapy to nothing to PD-1 blockade. And then we lost by a vote to a single arm trial concept because that group said, oh, this one's too big. It's never going to, it's never going to work. And we said, okay, fair enough. That was June. Four months later, uh, we changed the concept around a little bit. We, dropped, we had to drop the chemotherapy. The, the new cooperative group said, you know what? We love where your brain's at, but it's just not realistic. Let's simplify it, get rid of the chemo, makes it a smaller study. And we said, okay. And it took seven months from when we submitted to the new uh, to the alliance group, who's running it now, spoiler alert, and submitting it to the federal group, uh, which is called CTEP, the Cancer Therapeutics Evaluation Program. Now, I'm about to uh, talk about the CTEP role. I love CTEP. They have a difficult job and they have an important job. But it's kind of like going out to dinner with two people. It's like you, your loved one, and deciding on dinner. It's so simple. And maybe not always, but hey, what do you feel like? What do I feel like? I don't know. Let's go get some Chinese food. Great. Versus CTEP is like going out to dinner with 12 people and saying, do you want to, yeah, do you want, no, we ate Chinese food last time. Okay, what about, you know, just pub food? Oh, I hate pub food. And CTEP is like, you have to get a jury of your peers to unanimously agree on where to go to dinner. It turns out it's a very long process. And so here's what happened. We initially had some pretty good, um, you know, pretty good results. So it only took eight months to get the, um, the study approved, which is actually pretty short. And then it took four months to get ready to launch. So it only took a year at this point. We're at, we're at Labor Day 2017. And I remember it was Labor Day 2017 because that's when the preventative PD-1 study um, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, there was a positive, what's called re recurrence-free survival benefit, meaning, you know, it worked a little bit better at delaying uh, you know, the recurrences in uh, skin melanoma. What? what does that have to do with our project? Very little. But they didn't really realize that. They didn't realize the difference between the good news that just came out in skin melanoma and what we were trying to do in mucosal. And the, the, folks at, the folks at CTEP who really have 
uh, an important and difficult job, got together and said, we don't like this trial all of a sudden because we know that preventative nivolumab is better than ipilimumab. And so we feel it's unethical to not give half the people in this study PD-1. Now we said, well, what about the one dose that we're giving everybody? Uh, we're giving everybody one dose. And you just heard uh, Dr. Pliny say that we just had this amazing trial that showed that one neoadjuvant dose, one dose before surgery, was better than doing it afterward. We knew, we had a sense, I think, uh, the, those of us that were putting this trial together, we had a sense that it was a good idea. But when you're trying to go out to dinner with 12 other people, any one of those 12 people can, can sort of torpedo uh, your idea for some good Chinese food. And, and that's unfortunately what happened here. And so uh, am I bitter that they called it unethical? Yes, <laughs> because I like to think of myself and I may not be the smartest or the tallest or, you know, whatever, but I try to be ethical. Um, so I'm still very frustrated by this because when you show it to melanoma people, even today, if I pulled the melanoma people, is this a cool trial? Like, would it still be relevant today? It would actually, wouldn't it? It's sad that it would be, but seven years later, it still would be a really cool question to have asked and answered. Oh, well. So for two years, I literally was like, I'm never doing this ever again. Um, one of my mentors has a saying, life's too short to do these large cooperative group trials. I said life's too short to try to convince 12 people to go to dinner with you. Um, and I hate, I, I really was at a, at a low point. But um, eventually, you know, you, you dust yourself off and, and a couple of years later, we said, all right, June of 2019, let's go. We're going to put this concept together because uh, a group from the NRG wanted to do it. And I was like, all right, well, I'm not, I'm not going to totally give up. Um, it took about a year and a half to get the concept approved. So the first time took a year. This time took a year and a half. We're out to November of 2020. Uh, then, unfortunately, as we were getting our tools together, we we had a, a vendor, a, 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 a company that we're paying to do the PDL one analysis, literally just stop answering our emails and just ghosted us, which you'd never think of as something that could go wrong. But it was our um, integral biomarker. It was uh, impossible to move forward. And so you can see here that it took three straight three years. To, to submit the concept to actually get it going and a full seven years from the original concept that, you know, uh, was originally submitted to actually get started. Um, so here's the trial. I think that's less important. I think the, the doctors that are here know about the trial. I think as a patient, if you have a loved one with mucosal melanoma, there is right now a prevention trial if they've just had surgery. Uh, we're trying not to do the one size fits all. Everybody gets the same treatment. We're trying to prove that the blood vessel blocking pill might be useful as prevention. Uh, but it's just taken forever to get to this point. So this is our medium immunotherapy melanoma subtype. It works some of the time, but not good enough. And so we're trying to improve things. And my perspective is certainly not the only one, but I think I just happen to be, you know, involved in some of the some of the active things. So uh, I've been talking a lot about the, you know, the, the trials in mucosal. I guess that's why you asked me here. So now to switch gears, um, that part of the, the talk is over. We're, we're sort of at the third bullet point, which is what happens when PD-1 blockade just isn't very good at all. And. You don't try to build off a foundation that's shaky. Um, I, I had a gross looking eyeball tumor here. I took it out. That's why the, the slide looks weird. Even Linda asked me, was like, does this mean to be blue? I was like, yeah, we don't need to free people out with an eyeball tumor. Okay. So it turns out this type of cancer is one of the very few in this country that is not influenced by how rich you are. Okay. It's one of the very few. And the reason for that is that our treatments just absolutely, you know, are, I wouldn't say they're, they don't help anybody because they can, but they need to be a whole lot better. And it turns out 
all the money in the world doesn't always necessarily buy you better outcomes if the tools you have are really just this primitive. And so here I'm showing the Ipinevo curves that we've shown you and we've been very excited about for skin melanoma have been tested by our colleagues at, at MD Anderson and our colleagues in Spain. And these are not even really that flat. If, if uh, you believe it over time, you know, very few people, I would say probably one in eight, one in 10 are cured instead of half, you know, which is what skin melanoma is doing. So we need to improve on this. So um, there was a big sort of landmark uh, 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 trial that compared PD-1 immunotherapy or Ipilimumab CTLA-4 uh, immunotherapy to this newer drug. And the drug is, uh, is called Tibentafus. Um, it is a engineered sort of T-cell receptor drug. And the way it works is instead of one sticky end, it has two sticky ends on it. One sticky end grabs a CD3 immune cell, a lymphocyte uh, in, the, in the patient's body. The other end is where it's a very sticky end that uh, recognizes a protein on pigmented cells, but especially uveal melanoma cells called GP1. And there's a lot of biology there. It turns out that really sticky end can only be really sticky if you engineer it for a specific language that your immune system speaks. Everybody's immune system speaks two languages, one from their mom, one from their dad. They picked the most common language like English in the world is one of the most common languages spoken, but only about 40 to 50 percent of the world speaks English in any in any fashion. Right. So that's what this is. It's called HLA-0201. You have to have that immune system language. You have to be born with that language for you to be you know, eligible for this treatment because the, the drug is just built for that language and that language only. But it turns out that when you compare how long people live, uh, when they get this drug, Tibentafus versus standard immunotherapy, uh, they live longer. Uh, none of us are celebrating and saying that we've cured the disease entirely, but this was a landmark improvement because we went from 15 years ago not having any immunotherapy to five to seven years ago being excited to try the immunotherapy pembrolizumab to realizing that it sucked for uveal melanoma and already finding a drug that for 40% of people is better. And so that is, I think, the pace at which we're trying to move. We're trying to move the needle very, very quickly. But here's where I said all the money in the world didn't really matter for uveal melanoma. Well, it may start to matter. And why is that? It may, it's because if you have less disease when you start, it seems like you do better on this drug. And so you ask yourself, well, who are the people that have smaller metastases with uveal melanoma? They're the ones plugged into specialists that get scans every few months. They're not being told, oh, don't worry about it. There's nothing that can be done. If it, if it comes back, it comes back. Just go live your life. They're the ones plugged into to doctors asking them to come back and forth for surveillance. There's also, this is a map of how common that language is, that HLA-0201, and orange is more common, blue is less common. And so you can see that ancestrally, uh, this happens to be, you know, more for people of uh, Western European ancestry, which is okay for uveal melanoma. Uveal melanoma is most common for those people. But of course, it does impact people who are East Asian. It does impact people who are South Asian who have Afro-Caribbean ancestry to a lesser extent. So we are sort of, you know, accidentally leaving people behind because we've designed a drug for the most common population, but it's still not reaching everybody. And so I would argue that eye melanoma, where five years ago it didn't matter what your socioeconomic status was, is no longer going to be the case because the HLA-0201 uh, is variable by ancestry. Not everybody even checks for it, I think. Uh, big centers like Stanford and, and my institution do, but uh, it's not a universal thing yet. Um, to get the drug, you have to like, you have to have sort of a part-time part job of caregiver uh, to, to help you through it. It's a once a week drug that is difficult to tolerate in the beginning. So you, you, you can't just be 
working a full time job on your own with no sick leave. You have to really be able to to go through this. So I think um, it's nice to have this advance, but we have to be cognizant as melanoma oncologists. Um, who are we bringing with us with the rising tide and who are we who are we leaving behind? So anyway, this is another slide I can switch past. Um, I wanted to also end with some cellular therapy examples because Dr. Beethoven Warner beautifully, I knew she would do all the hard work and then I could just waltz in and say, you guys are experts. I don't have to explain it too much. So we, we are doing uh, cellular therapy in non-sun exposed melanomas, as she pointed out. Um, we have, uh, it's a team sport. So this is us in, uh, in Italy, uh, with a couple of my uh, current colleagues, um, it's a small group of people passionate about doing this work, and um, it, it's exciting to work together and, and, and continue to, to use cytotherapy to move this forward. So my institution, like Stanford, like everybody, loves to highlight success stories. And so uh, this was a, a patient originally of Dr. Beethoven Warner's, and uh, I was uh, uh, able to, to follow Roberta through. So this is like, going, you know, this is online. This gentleman actually had acromelanoma. Um, didn't have a whole lot of disease. I wanted to show you, uh, kind of like Dr. Beethoff Warner said, we don't want very rapidly growing tumors um, because it takes time to grow. So this is a small, oh, you can't see my point. So on the left, the yellow things are the liver tumor. Uh, it was relatively small. He had a few other tumors. I thought I would just show you that uh, this is at 18 months and sort of ongoing, a, a nice complete response. So we're really crossing our fingers and toes that. Uh, Roberto was cured. Um, he's thrilled, by the way, that I talk about. It. He loves it. I had a grainy uh, marathon photo. He ran the marathon less than a year after doing till, and uh, it was awesome. It's just so grainy that I, I was like, I'm not going to show it. It was like me and him, and he's looking sweaty and grainy, and I'm like, <laughs> so just imagine that you saw that photo. Um, here's a clinical trial that we're running in eye melanomas, where I said. We got to ditch the PD-1 backbone. It doesn't work very well. So we have a pilot study of using lifelucil uh, in this population. So we had a, a, a young gentleman uh, uh, come in and had tried, you know, the standard uh, ipilimumab, nivolumab, had tried one other clinical trial. We had uh, a tumor underneath the skin, and right under it, there was a bit of liver tumor that was accessible. So they actually took two tumors out at the same time, and uh, at baseline. Um, get a painful, the, the picture on the left is showing a painful rib metastasis, um, outlining that. And then there were, you know, legit tumors in the liver. It wasn't just one tumor that I showed you for the previous patient. This patient had multiple. And so, uh, 18 weeks in, the patient actually quickly said, boy, my rib feels better. And, and that was helping us, uh, feel optimistic. Um, and even though our study radiologist said, yeah, the tumors are stable, um, I was noticing that, like, if you look at the grayish type of color of the tumor, it looked kind of darker, like the center was a little more, um, more dead, less dense. So I said, you know what, why don't we get a PET scan as well? Because sometimes it's not a perfect test, but sometimes the PET shows you the tumors in a different way. And interestingly, we, we saw a lot of dead liver tumors um, because they're not lighting up yellow like the bottom of the heart is here um, uh, on the right side. So the the rib tumor had a rim around it, which we were wondering, you know, maybe those are immune cells metabolically active trying to kill the tumor. And on the right side in the liver, you don't see, uh, you know, anything lighting up too much. So I was getting very excited. And then uh, the job really humbles you and teaches you how to, how to live your life outside of work as well. Because uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of dead tumor cells, but then at month nine, um, you know, there was at least one new tumor that we saw. And because as Dr. Beethoven Warner mentioned, it's a one and done treatment, nobody really feels comfortable saying, well, there's one new, new tumor, don't worry, you know, let's just watch it. So we had to uh, recommend additional treatment. And this is considered growth of the disease after just nine months. But we're trying to improve on this. We're trying to, we're trying to work. I think we're seeing these preliminary benefits. Um, 
they're just not ready for prime time yet. And we're excited to sort of learn from these tumor samples and, and, and try to improve on using cell therapy in, in eye melanoma as well. So my last slide, uh, second to last slide. Um, I hope I've convinced you a little bit that melanoma is not just one disease and we can use things like mucosal melanoma with the blood vessel blocking paradigm, um, eye melanomas that have this HLA specific approach to sort of say, you know, if I have a non-sun exposed melanoma, you should be able to ask your physician, hey, you know, it's not a very common one. How many have you treated? Or which physicians do you know who have treated some? And do you like go out to dinner with them? Do you text them? Are you friendly with them? Or is this one of those things that, you know, you see once every, you know, presidential administration and you're trying to treat exactly the same as your other moments. So I know not everybody can be seen at, at Stanford or, or MSK, but uh, your physician should be able to reach out to somebody at Stanford or MSK or wherever on your behalf. So um, with that, again, I think I ran over. I'm sorry. And I really appreciate um, the uh, invitation. This is the view from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and uh, looking out over Central Park. So thank you very, very much.